On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Tessa, and Tessa was raised by a controlling narcissistic mother. It's a story of generational trauma, fear, surviving, being good enough, gaslighting, enemies, and healing. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Tessa. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I am doing well, and if you want to be a guest on our show like Tessa is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there is a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Please do read all of the instructions and either fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button or email us at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com. And today we are going to hear Tessa's story and a big trigger warning for physical abuse in this story, childhood physical abuse in this story up until I think the age of 18, maybe a little bit older, there will be uh, physical abuse discussed in a, in a few spots. So a big trigger warning there. And you're going to hear a story today of generational trauma, how you might just think it's about one member of the family when it is your your mother, who's the main culprit here. But then we find out that maybe the rest of her family isn't uh, the greatest either. So uh, a big uh, thank you to Tessa for, for being our guest. So without further ado, Tessa, the floor is now yours. I grew up in a single parent household with my mother. Uh, my father and my mother separated when I was about two. Um from that moment on it was very much like maternal family only um paternal family don't exist they're bad they're awful have nothing to do with them so i was kind of raised with fear so it's always kind of like you don't do anything wrong because you're fear getting in trouble getting a smack or something like that being ignored for like a week kind of thing it was just not worth it so there's always that kind of constant fear so yeah I just grew up with my mum and her family so I was very close to her mother my grandmother and my mother's siblings my uncle and my aunt and to me that was my family in a way so I was kind of raised in the sense of yeah I had my mum but I would spend most weekends at my grandparents house and my aunt and uncle actually lived there at the time. So in a way, it was kind of like tr- I was kind of treated like a younger sibling almost, even though there's quite a few years difference between us. Can you explain a little bit about the fi- family dynamics when it comes to your aunts, your uncles, uh, your grandparents on your mother's side and who your mother was and her role, I guess, within her family? And then uh, what type of um, person she was uh, or is um, as just a a person in everyday life, how she shows herself, how she portrays herself, and maybe if she's different uh, behind closed doors, uh, and then how she is within the actual family structure. So, um, again, my grandmother, I I called my grandmother mum. I also called my mum mum so it got a bit confusing when they were both around um but my younger years I didn't really see anything or notice anything bad per se it's like back in the 80s you know kids would get in trouble they'd get smacked and stuff like that it was kind of the norm um my gran and me were very close Again, I kind of saw her as a mother figure and my mum's siblings, my aunt and my uncle, um, 
again, they were just kind of like older brother and sister. My uncle was just always going out, so he was hardly around. I got him doing quite well in the sense of he's always nice and kind. Um, my aunt, not so much. I think looking back now, there might have been a bit of jealousy because I kind of came in and took the role as the youngest in the family. So it always seemed to be a vibe that she didn't quite like me. And I would always be the one to just try and make everyone happy. With my mum, I didn't really see her that much, to be honest. There was always things going on. So again, weekends, I'd get my grandparents, I'd go out with my gran, I'd go to parties with my gran. It was all quite cool. But again, things just started to change as I got older. But I do remember growing up, there was always some kind of drama going on. There was always something. And I think at first it seemed like it was issues with my dad and his family. So we were all, we all lived quite close together in the same area. So the times that I would bump into my dad, it would be very embarrassing. It's like, I kind of know who you are, but I don't have that emotional connection. So I was always a bit embarrassed. Um, We'd also see his mother on like public transport and stuff, and she would scowl. And then I'm kind of reminded by my mom, you know, she doesn't like you. She doesn't like me. So you don't need to like her, just ignore her. So I did. So yeah, childhood, really young. I didn't really do much with my mom. It was always me doing things with other people. And then when I was home, I would play out with friends. So I'd be like, on the whole weekend like get up at nine o'clock ride my bike and come back at like nine o'clock aged seven eight and in those days obviously we didn't have mobile or anything so I was quite free and then it just kind of changed when I got to teenagers we talked before this talk mm -hmm. and a thing that came up besides the you know, generational trauma as a whole was that your mom n always needed an enemy of, yes. of sorts. Yes. And that you feared her. You didn't understand why you feared her, possibly, but you know you feared her. But it's possibly that that, that energy that she gave off or maybe how she was behaving, that there always was this um, thing that she was angry at or people that might have been at the receiving end of something mm -hmm. and you as a child knowing that you did not want to be at the receiving end of that thing no matter what it was or uh, you unconsciously took this role yes absolutely so the fear was the fear of getting in trouble I saw her rage I saw and felt what her anger towards me um could and would be so it was just a case of avoid that make everyone happy and then that wouldn't happen but as I got older it just became more difficult I think once you kind of reach an age where your person your personality is coming out and you're trying to be you I think that's when it was kind of squashed or just not liked. So again, I started changing how I acted at home. So my true personality, me, bubbly, funny, excitable, bouncy, was always at school. So I had a lot of friends, um, teachers liked me. It was all good. But at home, as I started getting older, I started getting um, more quiet. I didn't really talk. I didn't speak to adults. And then I started actually having a fear of adults, anyone older than me. I didn't know how to talk to them. I didn't have to communicate. I was just scared. And going around to my friends' houses, I was allowed to go to friends' houses. Um, I was always scared of the father figures. Even though I feared my mum, it was the men that scared me because I just didn't really understand the whole concept of dad. It was like, what is this? What is this person? I don't really get it. How am I supposed to talk to you? Mm. So with adults, I was uber aware and probably hypersensitive. 
of emotions and reading expressions. And I just thought that most adults didn't like me. And if I got a glimmer of just niceness, which was anything, they could have just asked me how my day was. I was just like, that adult is the most amazingly friendliest person in the world. I must like them. They must be so cool. So I definitely clung on to adults that seemed to like me, I guess. I thought that was just the best thing ever. So um, when I was around 11, that's kind of when things started changing completely. Um, That's the age that you would start secondary school, high school over here. Um, And again, I guess that's when I started turning into adolescent. Things would change. There'd be boys come into play. Um, So my mum's behaviour really changed then. But a lot of things around that time, I think that's when I realised that my home life is very different to my my school friends if I wanted to go to the park after school or something my friends would call home and be like to their mum oh xyz and I remember a friend said love you at the end of the call and I was like kind of things they say in movies and for some reason I thought let me try it when I call my mum <laughs> and um call her and, and said it at the end and it was just dead silence because there was no showing of affection like when I was younger it would be like kiss goodnight and everything like that and then it just stopped and then from 11 there was no hugs there was no I love you there was no sort of fuss on special days like a birthday or anything like that so I just found it really difficult and I thought that was normal until I started seeing the way that friends would interact with their parents but yeah, the, the strictness just continued. I was just allowed to do less and less and less. And I remember my dad actually tried to get in contact with me. Um, I don't know how he got my address, but I found a letter ripped up in the bin. It was just at the top of the bin, so I saw it. And I put got it and put it together, and it was just like him trying to reach out and left details and everything like that. I just remember hiding it, but thinking, I'm going to get in so much trouble if she realises I've got this letter. So there was a lot of keeping me away from other people. And I guess that's where her anger and her rage was aimed at. So at that time, how um, we were saying before, how there was like different kind of enemies at certain points, there'd always been a constant enemy up to that point, I guess. And I guess because he wasn't around then I would be on the receiving end of any anger any issues I got that so she's in a bad mood it would be me I would spend a lot of time in my bedroom tiptoe around just in case um she blew up at me um and just to avoid situations like as a, a saying that she would say to me a lot um I love you, but I don't like you. And I think for me, that just made things worse because I always just really try to make people like me. Because if my mum doesn't like me, then obviously there's something wrong. So I have to try extra harder. But there was times where she would, I guess because she wanted a reaction. And like you said, in, in terms of having an enemy, when there was no enemy or nothing going on, she would just make something up to cause drama so there was times where she would accuse me of doing things to be able to tell me off and again I was quite I was a good child but she would say stuff like I was stomping upstairs and I'd be like I'm actually not and then she went for a period of doing that so the first time I went upstairs she called me down because she said I stomped and I was like I didn't but again with my family like there's a thing of not talking back and it's very different so I say you can respond but talking back is when you interject or you're rude I was just like well I didn't because and that was seen as talking back so I couldn't so I guess the first times I just let it go because I was like maybe I was stomping and didn't realize so then I started 
creeping up the stairs to avoid those creaky parts so she wouldn't think I was stomping up the stairs. And then, of course, I'd still get in trouble. And I'm like, is it me? I'm, I'm going mad. I don't, I really, it's just louder downstairs. So I actually made a point of when she sent me to go upstairs, I knew she was going to call me back. So I waited at the bottom of the stairs and she called me back and said I stomped up the stairs. And that's probably the first time that I'd realised that there was something wrong. Because why am I getting in trouble for something she said I did when I know I didn't do it? So all the other times I was like, did I? What am I doing? I feel bad. I feel terrible. Maybe I am a stroppy teenager. And I absolutely wasn't. So she would do many things and stop when she, I guess, didn't get the reaction she wanted. So I was always smacked as a child, um, hit in the face. And she only stopped when I stopped crying. So that was number one. The stomping of the stairs situation. Um, she did it a few times. And the last time she did it, I made sure that I opened up the door when she called me. So there was absolutely no way I would have had time to go up and down the stairs. And I, she, she didn't say what she was going to say because she knew it was impossible. So she couldn't get away with it. So I was like, yeah. And she was just like, didn't say anything. So then she didn't do it. So there were lots of, I guess, when I was younger and looking back at it now, I saw it as a game. And the only way to win was to outsmart her. Does that sound bad? To outsmart. Well, for I was going to say before that, First of all, you're a clever you're a clever kid, and <laughs> you are one step ahead of your mom already, and yeah. you're thinking on your toes of solutions to these problems. I had to to survive. To be honest, I had to think of every single scenario of what would happen if. So it's kind of like when you do a um. You know, like a health and safety type of test where you're like uh, analyzing all the possible outcomes. I guess I did learn to do that. I'm a very good detective, but <laughs> I, I did that a lot growing up. And it's funny you say that because I didn't really notice. But yeah, again, stepping on eggshells, but also just playing out every single scenario in my head to avoid the inevitable, to annoy, uh, to avoid that fear, to annoy the sorry to avoid that fear and to avoid what was coming you're being gaslit as a young child your mom is playing these uh control games um and uh, you know she's m making these things up to keep you in line for no reason whatsoever or with well, a reason being for her own feeling of power and control because something must not be going that way within her life in any sort of way and it's being played out on you and you and your response is well in 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 the world of crime if you want to catch a thief, you have to think like a thief. What, That's very what, true. what would they do? What is their process? If I can get into that mind, I can get one step ahead of them and then I can catch them. And your thought process is if I can think of every single scenario that my mom is going to throw at me, I can stay one step ahead of it and I won't get in trouble or or it's the best possibility to not get in trouble. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, again, that just that just played into the whole the self-confidence thing and being able to have proper conversations with people. I just had no social skills in a way I had social skills with people my age but anyone older I just didn't know how to communicate with and then when I was at school um we'd actually moved to um a different area at this time and it was a predominantly um white area and 
unbeknownst to us, it was actually a racist area. And I had a lot of grief walking to school, was called the N-word, had things thrown at me. And I remember just telling my mom and she's like, oh, well, it's just, you know, just get on with it kind of thing. She dealt with that too when she was younger. So it wasn't really a big deal. But for me going to school and having to deal with teachers that had, I would say that had racist ideals or whatever, because I know that they treated me differently. Um, When I started getting in trouble for minor things at school, it became very difficult. So a lot of the patterns of behavior that she exhibited, some of the teachers were exhibiting. So I would get detention from having my shirt untucked, my shirt's untucked because I'm insecure about my side and trying to hide whereas people were throwing sewing machines out of windows and doing far worse and not getting in trouble and there's me with my shirt untucked and getting detention and I I remember hanging out with um two other black students and they just made it impossible for us to be friends so um we would all get in trouble, say we're in a gang up to no good when we were literally just being normal kids, like hanging out and listening to music in the hallways and that was it. Um, but I remember their friend's parents came into the school and spoke to the teachers and it stopped. And my mum didn't. And because that happened, I then had the brunt of all of these teachers and my mum And those were quite dark times for me. I remember just not wanting to be here and just thinking, you know, I don't really understand why I'm disliked by so many adults, why I'm not good enough almost. And I was, yeah, I just went through a really tough time for about, a year and a half with no support and no one to talk to and no kind of backup. Because I kind of think, you know, I watch TV and stuff like that. And I just think, you know, your family are for you. I, I didn't grow up with any siblings or anything like that. And it's like, if I had an older brother or sister, they would come and rescue me, that kind of thing. And I just didn't have anyone who was willing to, willing or wanting to, to stick up for me, have my back. And that's, how I grew up so again I was always kind of fearful really there wasn't anyone that I could turn to so it was quite a lonely time when I was about 16 that's when I had my first ever boyfriend I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend I wasn't allowed to talk to boys and obviously you know I'm not even allowed to have friends in my house at this point but there was a period of time where my mum would get back from late from work and um Sometimes I'd invite friends over and I'd be like, you have to be gone by six. Honestly, just 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 go. And it was fine. So then I had this boy that I liked. He liked me. And I was like, wow, someone actually likes me for me. A bit crazy. Um, so we actually started dating. And there was one time that he actually came home and my mum came home early. And I just was like, this is it. I'm going to die. This is just it. The worst thing that's going to be imaginable. She's just going to do it in my days. And she got home. I was at the top of the stairs. And again, she knows my my pattern. I obviously seemed a bit freaked out. So I leant over. I was like, hi. And she kind of gave me a funny look. So she's like, knew something was up. So she walked up the stairs. And then my boyfriend at the time sort of said hi, not realizing what he had walked into because this wasn't a normal situation. And then she called me downstairs and she's like, you need to tell him to leave now. And I was like, well, he doesn't actually know the way he walked back with me. So I walked with him to the station. And for me, that was just kind of biding time. Like what story can I possibly come out with to get out of this? I, I don't know. Yeah. So I, I literally walked into the rage, the insults. She caught, she said that she called my grandmother and she said that both my grandmother and my uncle were disappointed in me having a boy in my house and a boy in my room. 
um, and then she put my aunt on the phone and she was just insult into, into after insult you're a slag you don't have boys in your house you don't have boys in your room I just remember crying because I was just thinking I'm not any of these things that you say I am so why are you saying these things it's just not nice I didn't do anything wrong like out of all my friends I was the last to have any type of boy interested in me let alone actually having a boyfriend totally insecure I didn't feel worthy of having anyone interest me in in me anyway so just to hear all of these really horrible words said to me was really painful but it it was done in a way to crush me to take my well any type of confidence that they thought I had and it was really difficult so from then from that moment on even though I wasn't really allowed to have this boyfriend again I was 16 um, going on 17 I stayed with him and it kind of just got to the point where it was okay so around towards my 18th birthday I actually started college and I couldn't cope being in that house anymore like every time she was in a bad mood I would get it I would have to go above and beyond to just avoid unnecessary drama it's draining having to be in survival mode forever and that's all I knew survival mode like I said before it's just like one tiny little thing I have to analyze so much to see what the best outcome could be and it it could be like a small thing like a conversation and I think after the period that I um, had my exams she was around a lot less I didn't do very well in my exams it's, I can never remember what she said but I know it's a rant maybe I zoned out at the time and just put up a non-emotional wall and just ignored what she said but it was it's like a rant so she would say what she says and then bring in other people to it and say how disappointed they are and the insults. And then she didn't tell me to leave. So I was like, is that it? And then she's like, go to bed. So I went to bed. And then like 15 minutes later, she'd come on and turn on the lights and start up again and then tell me to go and do things. So she told me to go and tidy her room, um, fold all her clothes, put them away. And then when I finished, I said, I finished, I was like, right, go to bed. And then she'd come back 15 minutes later and turn on the light. So it was like a lot of, um, I don't know, it's weird. It's like torture methods in a way. You're trying to get to sleep and then someone's coming to wake you up and then just be in control of the situation. So, um, yeah, I moved out eventually. So during that period, just after the GCSE period, um, exam period, it's like another form of punishment. She would just stop talking to me. But as I grew up, I kind of liked it because it meant that I didn't have to do the tiptoeing. I didn't have to think about the conversations and what that led to. And the talking would just gradually start up again. So it could be a whole week of just being in silence. And I just have a vivid imagination. So I'd be fine. That was good for me. But it meant that I didn't have an emotional connection with an adult growing up, which obviously isn't great for development, but the times that she was silent, it was cool. But during this period, she started coming home a lot later. She stopped buying food. Um, during that period, I had part-time jobs and stuff, so I was buying my own clothes. She didn't buy me anything as such, and I was cooking my own meals. So I was very independent. and looking back I'm like you should have just moved out you had money you had everything but I wasn't allowed there was always that thing you're not allowed you have to do what you're told so again I just um I started college um learned the things that I wanted to learn because before that as well I I had dreams of going to veterinary school and um I wasn't allowed to choose that subject I had to do what she wanted me to do I wasn't allowed to go to college I had to remain in school which is called sixth form over here um 
So even that she chose, I wasn't allowed to make my own decisions. So I went to college and I gradually just started staying at my grandmother's house for longer periods of time. So before it was the weekends and then it was just like going into Monday and then I just got away with it. I, I kind of moved out. So when I got to my grand's house, I was asking her, you know, um, is it OK if I go and see this friend at this time? And she's like, yeah, yeah. And they got to a point she's like, you do know you don't have to ask me, right? You're, you're old enough to just do what you want to do. And I just found that so gobsmacking. I was like, what do you mean? I am allowed? OK. So then I started going out more. I was still with the same boyfriend. And for me, that's probably when I started living my life how I want to. And I I still wanted to see my mum. And I would um, call. She moved by this time closer to my grandmother. But I think this is when she thought she could have her own life. So she had a place which had an extra bedroom and she was like, you know, this is your room, but let me just get sorted first. And I remember going to see her. Sometimes she wouldn't be there. Sometimes she'll say, come over, didn't open the door. And then she'll say, oh, sorry, I fell asleep. So I always had that yearning to want to be with my mum. And she definitely played into that. So what does that mean, what you said there for one second, about your mom wanting to have her own life? Mm. Is, is that what you said? <laughs> if I, if, I did. I did. So did you feel like this whole time that maybe your mom, and I hope I don't insult you, That's okay. um, did maybe, had you, then resented having you, and in some ways, in a lot of ways, you were your own parent kind of growing up. She had these controlling behaviors of you, but was really not a parent. I mean, you raised yourself in many ways. And you were self-sufficient as this young child. Like when you were telling me about you Ed, as an eight-year-old cooking and, and walking and doing whatever, I'm thinking you're also walking with like a briefcase to your, a <laughs> little briefcase to your office, you know? Um, and you're just a, a little adult. And so now you say those words just came out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. So do you think that your mom was always just like, I can't wait until she's not my responsibility, but at the same time, She's just has this also controlling manner. It's like this, it's this, it's like, uh, what's the, I don't even know what the best way to put it is. It's just, uh, it, controlling, it, it, I guess. She, she's just controlling, but at the same time, she doesn't want you there at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't even know what yeah. you even call that. Yeah. I, yeah. So I, always felt the resentment but I she didn't have, get to have the life that she possibly wanted because she obviously had to do things a certain way and that's where this whole gratitude thing comes from like I sacrifice so much you're here you should be grateful and it's so like, well I didn't really ask to be born but thank you but you know whatever um but yeah definitely resentful definitely so life seems to be going pretty well right here, but eventually a wrench does get thrown into your plans as your mom uh, moves back in with your grandmother. So what happens from here? For whatever reason, my mom moved back to my grand's house and we had to share a bedroom. So things changed again completely so there's not only the resentment that you know I guess she had to move back but now she's in a room sharing a room with her daughter so the room I was actually in used to be her room which she shared with my aunt um my aunt moved out at that point my uncle had moved out so it was just me my gran and her partner so my mum then shared the room with me and <sighs> 
again, just this person, this optimistic person, I thought was just going to be the greatest thing in the world. I don't know why. I absolutely don't know why. So I was excited that she was going to be there. We could finally have a relationship. And then it just slowly reverted to how things were. So immediately, it's like, this room's covered in all my stuff, like a massive Eminem poster and things like that. Um, she would, she had, like, certain um, patterns of behaviour. She'd stay up really late and watch TV and then fall asleep on the sofa, and that was just her thing. So she would have the TV on. And at that point, I was actually working full time to save money to go to college. Um, the second type of college. I went to two colleges. Um, and I remember this time where she had the TV on late, I fell asleep. And when I woke up, she was also asleep. So I'm like, okay, I'll turn the TV off, turn the TV off. And then she would wake up and turn it back on. And of course, I would wake up, wait till she was asleep and turn it off. And I think this went back and forth about three times. And then the very last time, she just blew up. She was like, why are you turning it off? And I'm like, I thought you were asleep. And I got work um, in the morning, so I just wanted to get to sleep. And then she just literally was screaming, shouting, pinned me to the floor. And that was the last time she was physical with me. But when she did that, my gran burst into the room. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, finally, someone's going to save me. No one's ever, like, been in this position before because it was always done when no one was around. And my gran was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And my mum shouted, she turned the TV off. And my gran kind of just looked at her and walked out the room and left me there. And I was just, like, just not really understanding because I hadn't analysed this, I hadn't thought that turning off the TV was a big deal, especially if it's in the middle of the night, early hours in the morning. I'm not doing a bad thing. And then I just got up. It was five o'clock in the morning. I got ready. I, I was never really allowed to have locks on bathroom doors, even at that age. I was like 18, so she just burst in the bathroom whilst I'm in the bath and I can't say anything. Um, she just scowls at me and didn't say anything. So I think that was the first time that I realised I was definitely on my own. There was no one going to save you ever. Like Anyone can do anything to you. It doesn't really matter. And I think that's when um, she moved out shortly after that. And... I went to college and everything like that. And she would text now and again, um, but that was about it. We didn't really have a relationship. So I then went to university. So eventually you go back to school and you're still not feeling loved by anyone. You have a boyfriend who isn't the best, but he does drive to see you, even though your interactions with him when he visits aren't the greatest and you're just accepting the bare minimum you graduated but aren't feeling great about your abilities and you don't want to live uh at home with your grandmother so you and it's understandable so you decide to have a child and get married to your boyfriend and you get your own apartment. So how does your mom feel about all of this? So initially when I told her, I rung her and I was still at uni at that point and I was petrified because again, I was like still in this fear. And I, yep, she blew up at me. Yep, hated it. And then she called me, I think about half an hour later and was like, she would have these weird moments of niceness and I was always taken aback by it. I don't know if it was like her true self or who she really wants to be, but she was just like, you know, if I met a guy like that, then I would have had 10 children. So it was kind of fine. I got on away with it. But um, yeah, she was, I came back from university. She made sure I got married. 
I got married. None of my family came. She didn't come. I was like, are you going to come? She's like, well, no, I'm not going to come. And I remember a few years later, not to come off the story, but my, my gran asked me, why didn't you invite anyone to your wedding? And I was like, well, my mum told me that you didn't want to come. And she was just silent. So my mum was definitely running a lot of things and telling me things that people had said, which wasn't true, and then just kind of orchestrating things. So she was definitely, definitely in control. But when I was um, pregnant, she was really nice, um, took me shopping, um, was really keen on being that grandmother when I had my son. She would help out. She helped out that hospital. She had a different side. However, I would still have to do what she wanted and still kind of tread carefully. And I was going to say be that perfect person, but I don't know what perfect means at that point. But again, the type of person that I ended up with, it wasn't really a surprise that he kind of turned out the way he did. So again, he was doing bare minimum when we were together anyway. So he did the bare minimum when I had my son. And we separated when my son was about two years old, just because I got to the point where we had a conversation and it became very apparent that his expectations of me was to be that mum that stayed at home and just did everything and that would be it. We wouldn't even buy our own place. We would get like council housing and just be that type of family that did that. I couldn't pursue any dreams or any goals or anything like that. And I, I didn't want to end up in yet another controlling situation. So I ended it. I think for my mum, she thought at that point that somehow me, my son and her would get a place together. So she was always surprised that I didn't. I kind of fended for myself and then met someone else. So I meet guy number two. I start dating and live my life. My mum's good at um, babysitting. So in a way, I um, kind of reclaimed a bit of youth, really. I was only in my early 20s when I got pregnant anyway. So this was like mid-20s when everyone's meant to be out and having fun. So I was, started dating um, and met my now husband then. Um, we got together really quickly, um, thought we were like absolutely unique and decided to be together forever after like about a month, which was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and I fell pregnant really quickly. So again, it got to the point where I had to tell my mum something that I knew I was going to get in trouble for, even at age 24, 25, I was still fearful. So they hadn't met him yet. When I say they, it's like my grandma um, as well. But we, we, I took him around to my grand's house and everyone's going to be there. It was just my mum and my grand at that point. And I kind of explained how my mum was to my, my husband. Um, he didn't really get it, but he was like, okay. But he was a bit fearful because of all the things I'd explained. So we didn't actually tell her then. I copped out, I texted her, and then I just had a plethora of um, emails, long rants, emails, insults, you're this, you're that, you're going to have, you're going to be this type of person, you're going to have a string of kids, um, your uncle's disappointed, you, your aunts are disappointed, your grand. So all of that yet again. But that was the first time I decided enough was enough. And if that's really how you feel, then I won't have anything to do with you. So I didn't respond and I blocked her on my phone. And that's when she 
she um, emailed my then ex-husband and gave him information she thought would cause an issue, but she actually had the wrong information. She hadn't listened to me in the first place. Um, and he called me and was like, what's going on? I don't really understand what's going on. And obviously he's seen the side of my mum. So I explained. And he's like, well, she's emailed me and she he, she he forwarded the email that she sent him. And it was like saying stuff about me. And then she dropped the information and said, do what you will with that. So she definitely did it on purpose to cause trouble. But then that was the first time that I saw saw that she would go to the lengths of using someone else to hurt me and someone that she thought was not on my side as such so we did split up we did have our issues but he wasn't intent on ruining my life or anything like that so she thought he could get her on side she could get him on side so what I did I emailed her and said you know he sent me this email and she was like, oh, well, he liked two and didn't. Blah, blah. So and I was like, look, this is not my issue. This is ridiculous. So I emailed both of them. And in a way, I was left to my own devices. And those two then had their squabbling thing going on. He became an enemy out of that because he passed on the information. But yeah, that was the first time that I saw the lengths that she would go to to attempt to. I guess punish me if she couldn't get through to try and hurt. And again, another tactic, she would do what she did. I took a step back, but then she came back. And I was like, well, she's coming back. That's fine. She's learned her lesson. Maybe that was a boundary. It's not going to happen again. And then she was absolutely fine with the kids got involved was grand was really nice to my now husband and it was okay for a while but the way she treated me was very different to the way that she treated other people so she was really nice to everyone to my husband she would come round they would get on they would chat for hours and she kind of treated me like I was stupid, like I didn't really, I wasn't worth, I wasn't at the level that they were at when having conversations or talking. So it would be very much like I'm not involved in the conversations. If I said something, she would ignore. Um, but she still did things where I would have to serve. So she would ask things of me. She would tell me to do things and I would just have to do it. And again, I did it to avoid the inevitable, the inevitable rage. And that's when she started falling out with her siblings. And I would have to be that person to listen to her complain about people, really. I think she had so many disagreements when it came to work colleagues. She would be telling me, oh, this person at work did this, and I told them this. And then anyone and any kind of emotional thing that she had to release, I would have to be the one on the end of the phone call. And it was so draining. It would be like an hour call, just, uh-huh, okay. And sometimes I would be like, well, maybe if you said something this way, and then she'd blow up because she knows that she's right in that situation. Around that time, I started getting really bad stomach issues. And um, like, I literally can't get out of bed. And we went to the doctors. And again, I was scared of adults, never really want to bother people. So when I was there, I was like, yeah, I've got really bad, bad pet pain. And I remember she tried to move me and I was just in so much pain. I was shaking. And she was like, why didn't you say? <laughs> and again, I just never wanted to be bothersome. But um, they ran tests, they couldn't find anything. And they said, it's stress. It's actually just stress. I didn't really understand it, but they're like, what we're going to do is put you on some medication and maybe give you a therapist. So I started seeing my first therapist. She would ask me a lot of things that was going on. And it was nice because I got to have a conversation with an adult who allowed me to speak. 
But I didn't actually think that there was anything wrong. So when she started asking me about um, things that happened when I was a child and how I was, and I explained, and she was so confused. She was like, you do know that's abuse, right? I'm like, don't be silly. That's not abuse. It's just everyone's different. So that's just how we are. And I just dismissed it. So the, the, the therapy I got was okay, but it, it didn't really, it didn't really work because with therapy, I think you need to be willing to work on the issues that you have. And at that point, I didn't think I had issues. The years went on and I just had all of these issues. Um, issues with my ex-partner became really difficult. He became difficult when I essentially met someone new and our son wanted to call him dad. So I had a lot of um, abuse from him in terms of very similar to my mum. So if, say, he was in a bad mood or thought he didn't get his way, I would get lengthy emails, um, insults, you're this, you're that, you're this. So I then had my third child and moved out of London quite far away. Um, not too far, it's like an hour and a half, kind of. Um, and things were fine. She um, came to see me in hospital when I had baby number three, actually got in a picture with baby number three. She never takes pictures. She just looks really happy. And I think that's because in her mind, I was doing or having the life that she wanted me to have. I was married. I had kids. I had the husband. I had my own place. It was acceptable. However, her treatment of me was just exactly the same. I had to do what she wanted me to do. But it got to the point where things really took a turn for the worst. Um, my relationship with my ex-husband just really got worse, um, affected our son as well. He would start acting out. But because there was never an adult that would kind of call myself on his behavior and he saw the way that people would treat me he could do and say what he wanted so if he did something in front of my mum my mum would be like laugh it off and be like oh you two like we were siblings in a way and it's like well I definitely wouldn't have been able to say that to you now let alone then so that's weird but okay and then I was being undermined by my ex-husband so I then had a really difficult time with my son because of the influence and how other people treated me. So we got to a point where just before lockdown, my son went to live with his dad. And that's when I became absolute public enemy number one. The, the, the story, I chucked my son out. He now lives with his dad. Um, there was a situation basically when he essentially left home and his dad just cut off all communication with me. I couldn't get in touch. My son didn't want to talk to me and no one would help. Authorities didn't help because my ex-partner had already smeared me to teachers, etc. So they had a perception of me. Um, some of the things were backed up by my son. But again, that was his dad's influence. Um, and behavioural issues. My mum knew about everything, but didn't really get involved. She didn't want to be on the bad side of my son. Well, here we have a parental alienation situation going on. There's nothing you can do about your son. You know, once your ex-husband has his claws in him and everything that he said, the damage is done. Mm -hmm. And hopefully over time, your son will be able to see things and come back, but we're going to get a little bit into that more, but with your mom here, you know, with your mom, everyone's always an enemy and it doesn't matter mm -hmm. who that person is. And it's like, she'll sit on the fence. Yeah. And, um, you know, so she's not taking a side here with your son. She took a side earlier 
when it came to um, disliking your ex husband. Mm -hmm. But in this case, she's taking a fence sitting side until you never know how many years down the road where your son will feel the wrath of being an enemy for some reason. But in this case, she's taking this fencing position uh, um, because for her, in the art of war, this is the best tactical position for her life or how she lives her life of um, my enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm -hmm. And that's how she... That's how she goes about her life. And you're about to really find out here that that's how all of your family members go about their life. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm public enemy number one because I essentially allowed my son to leave because it was just, he wanted to be there, but there was always a case of he wanted to live with his dad, but his dad would do things like, oh, you can live with me one day and kind of be like, no, it's not the right time. So my son did things to force that situation. But in my mind, I knew the moment my son would go, my ex-husband would make it very difficult. And he did. He, succeed, he succeeded. But I think my thing at the time was, although I always felt that I didn't have backup from my family, that was solidified through them knowing the issues I had with my son and no one kind of did anything or said anything. Not like I wanted my aunt to get on the phone and blast him like she did to me, but it was like just nothing. And then when he left and I didn't know where he was, he wasn't in school. Um, I was telling my family this and it's just like absolutely nothing. Didn't do anything. But I wasn't talking to my mum at that time. And that's because I continue to have a relationship with her brother, my uncle, and his wife. So they had their falling out, and I said I wasn't getting involved. So at that point, I was I was doing what I wanted to do safely because I could just text her, like, I'm going to be seeing them. It's fine. I can't really do anything to me. I'm a grown-up. I'm an adult now. Um but she blew up with me when she said that she realized how much I was seeing them. Um, I was seeing them regularly, like, I don't know, not like every weekend, but we became friends and my um, husband really got on with my uncle. But she basically texted me saying I was disloyal. Um, she can't believe I'm still talking to them. Insult after insult. And it when you... I don't know if you've got an iPhone, but when you send a text message, I didn't realize that there's actually a limit. So it would be a, a break the limit. And then she continue. So then I blocked and then she realized I'm blocked. So it's the emails. Um, again, just full of rants and just nonsense and insults. And I spoke to my uncle about it. And he's like, yeah, well, that's what I'm, I'm getting as well. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not really going to tolerate it, but okay. So she remained blocked. And then I can only assume that she was relaying things to my gran that wasn't true. So my, my gran was always quiet. We didn't really spoke, but not, it was like surface level. And again, me being me thought that was a good relationship. Um, but she would sometimes ask questions, but many months after the fact. So it was always realizing that someone had said something and she acted on what that person said for many, many, many months. And I would be like, she's acting weird, but she's not going to say what it is. So I think it was then she must have said, like, why didn't you invite me to your first wedding? And it's like, well, told my mum that you said you didn't want to go. It was like, right. But she would then come out with things. It became very apparent that my mum was telling her one story and it wasn't the truth. So the consensus was that I'd chucked my son out. So she was treating me like I chucked my son out of my house when I'd been desperately trying to get support 
get people to help find my son, et cetera, et cetera. So after this, you go no contact, not just with your mom and your grandmother, but your whole family. So how are you feeling uh, about this? How are you healing? Uh, What are the issues that have been brought up? And I guess just what is your emotional state after uh, going through all of this and at the end here, you know, you lose your son a little bit and, and you lose your family. So I guess, is there a grief process? How are you actually doing and, and where did you go from here? So at first it was pretty scary because as we discussed, my family was what I thought was everything. In my mind, we were very close, um, but not authentic so at first it was a bit scary because I was like right I'm just gonna have no family then it's just gonna be me but in a way it was a relief it was a relief not having to do things I didn't want to do it was a relief not having to go above and beyond for people that just obviously didn't really deep down inside like me um I'd done a lot of research in terms of toxic family dynamics because I didn't really know what the term narcissistic meant or what that personality type meant I always thought it was like a I guess like a mental health condition that you would get diagnosed with so when I first started doing research I was just looking up toxic family situations because I knew obviously that was not normal like I see my husband's family and they would just be so (laughs) blown away if I even told them a tiny percentage of what's occurred and even telling you I've skipped so many parts there's just so many more things um but it just became a relief but I did at that time when I completely went no contact that's when my therapist actually said you know what I call it my graduation day she was like you're at a good place we don't need to do this anymore and I was like I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Feel it. Because I just got to the place of being able to be a hundred percent me all of the time and having that self-confidence and having that worth because I was able to filter out the noise or ignore the tiny whispers of not even tiny whispers, the massive whispers of doubt, which were implanted over time because I realized that it wasn't actually me because all of these things had happened and the falling out with someone and then them telling someone else something that completely didn't happen and just completely made something up just so they could get that person on side. So to see what I thought as a close family lie about me, also use my son, they started inviting him over and saying all these things um, about me, all these lies to him. And I, he would text me back saying, you know, when I try to attempt to reach out to him, don't talk to me. Um, these are my family, done this to my family. So they were basically reinforcing all of the rubbish that his dad was telling him as well. And they simply did it to hurt. So it was difficult to stay, take a step back but it was definitely worth it in the end. And I was fearful at first because you do get that pang sort of like loneliness, like I've got no one to talk to. And you, I see my husband with his family, he can go to his dad and have conversations. And it's like, well, it's just really weird. Like Mother's Day, I was used to it on Father's Day, made a joke about it. I used to give my mum a Father's Day card. So Mother's Day and birthdays, I don't have any of that. So I do have, that I used to have that kind of I guess FOMO thinking maybe it was just me maybe and then something would happen one of them would come out of the woodwork and send me a long run and call me whatever 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 out of nowhere and I would be quickly reminded that you absolutely don't need to be in that situation so I have done a lot of work and I definitely can look back at 
you know, when I first started placing boundaries, I obviously went in a bit too heavy handed. It was like, no. And if you don't respect me, then that's it. And now I'm like, you know, you could have just had a conversation and there's ways to deal with like narcissistic rage. You don't have to feed into it. And I think for a long time, that was my problem. I'm still working on it now. If someone tries to insult me, I'm like, well, I'm going to tell you how it, and really, so unnecessary because they're intent on just hurting you and saying what they want to say and they're not going to listen anyway well y- you're not used to knowing how to be angry no <laughs> so when people who don't know how to be angry or try to be angry for like their first times it's not going to come out like you want it to because you don't know what the line is you know you're finally allowed to be and you're trying to be that word allowed (laughs) it comes out in a weird way and what's interesting when listen to me listen to your whole story is that you're in survival mode the whole way in your childhood and you know you are and you're conforming to how um you know you need to survive because you're afraid of a specific outcome. And the specific outcome eventually happens to you, but you are older. So, you know, when you do eventually start to stand up for yourself, the outcome you were always afraid of when you were a child eventually does happen. You know, you will become public enemy number one. Not just your mom begins to hate you. Other people begin in your family begin to not like you. You've stood up for yourself. You no longer talk to them. You were ostracized from them. You're now at an age where you're able to handle it emotionally, even though it hurts. But imagine you were little and you did what you did and you stood up for yourself. Your life would have been probably a pure terror all like there would have been a constant yes you are you already got physically abused you know you already uh got verbally abused but it could have gone to another level if you weren't in that survival mode of how you were acting as a child and your biggest fear was to not be you know the rage and to not be part of this family which you thought was close Mm. um and at the end you know, you realize that even though a family who still talks to each other and is still, you know, on the phone with each other every day or communicating or getting together at all the holidays, it, it, for some people that might look like it's close, but in a toxic family, it's just this interwoven, um, enmeshed um life i don't even know uh, the full extent of it but it's not a healthy way to live you know cuz you were living in fear your whole entire life and now you are living outside of fear and you're free of it while they're still living in this constant state of chaos um and you know when you're a kid and as i said before like you survive the best way you knew how with uh, with as little chaos as possible going on um, to get there. And then you found out really what would happen if you did stand up for yourself and everything you feared is true, you know? Yeah. And you should, you know, you were this little little person that took care of themselves and you at the age, you know, you took care of yourself like in every way. Like you weren't just making your food and getting yourself to places. You were emotionally cocooning yourself and taking care of yourself in every way to stay as safe as possible. And you did it. And you really did it. And it was sad that you had to do it in that manner. And it was sa- it's sad that you have to go through life without really feeling a genuine love from your parent um, at all. But you, you did the best you could with the tools you did at a very young age with zero guidance. Zero. 
and you're sitting here and you're talking to me and you have a husband that loves you. You have three kids. One of them has been alienated, which is unfortunate, but that's, you know, the ex-husband, but you you know, you have a family and you have, I'm talking to you and you're in this amazing little studio um, and you have a huge smile and you really have a great smile. Um, and you should just be proud of yourself for being here and here, being here, uh, you know, going through all of your healing process, um, and really being really aware of all the things that happened and you still love them. Yeah. That's the crazy thing. That's the, it, I wish It'd be a lot easier if I could hate them. But I know a lot of them are just acting on what they think has occurred or what they think of me. But it's just unfortunate that they aren't able to communicate that. And I've said that. I'm like, I'm still getting random text messages sometimes from a different phone. And sometimes I feel like poking the bear or whatever. I'm like, "Mm, don't bother them this time. But then I'm like, this could all be so different if we just had a conversation. If you were willing to have a conversation, we could talk. We can have a conversation. It can be done. But you're not going to listen because you've already made your mind up. So I'm going to say this to you. Mm. How old are you? I turned 14. Okay, no, so you're 40. 40. So how old are your aunts and uncles? <sighs> They must, so I think my aunt is maybe mid, no, early 50s, and my uncle's possibly mid 50s. Yeah. Okay. So they're in their 50s. Your mom is what, 60? Yeah. Okay. Mid 50s, 60 years old. They've known your mom their whole life. They know how she is. They know what she's capable of saying to other people, your grandmother too. They are of said age. They are not children. They are mature enough to know that they should be asking questions, that they should be looking at things from all different angles, that they know your mother well enough that not everything she says is true. They are at an age where they should have been doing their own introspective work, which they've not been doing at all. They are of an age to take responsibility for everything they've done. And they haven't either. They're just part of this cycle. Um, And they haven't done any work at all. Um, And they are... I'm not going to say that they're excused for how they're acting because they haven't done any introspective work. I can't be 100% that they haven't. I'm going to assume they have not. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at a certain age, you know, and the amount of experience that you've had with your siblings, um, there should be uh, caution to what someone says and take it as absolute truth or they are, might be just as unhealthy as the other person and that they're all in a game within themselves and you and everyone else in them are just pawns in their own sibling structure, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. I don't know because if I'm I- out of like, I'm um, talking out of my butt here or if... <laughs> um, you know, or if that hits home at all, but, you know, there's just this very unhealthy dynamic between all of how they're, they're doing things. In my opinion. It definitely makes sense. And like you, you touched upon it. It's, it is a game essentially. And I think even when they've had their partners and brought them into it, they've got them involved and it's like, they're also getting involved in the game. And it's very hard to play a game as someone who's not, invested in playing along with them so yeah it is just a case of right this is moving forward this is how it's going to be this is how it has to be because 
like I said, with my mum, I cut her off then. She disappeared then. And then slowly but surely, it's just the same behaviour. And I've given so many chances. And there's been so many points where we could have sat down and had conversations and no one wanted to. So this is, I guess, just how it has to be. There's no going back because this life with, I don't have anxiety anymore. Soon as the anxiety went, and I, I, it took a few months to settle in and realise, I was like, this is how people feel. You don't constantly have that feeling like you're going to get in trouble, not always on edge, not always jumpy. And I'm like, this is so good. And then when there was my mum that was cut off and nothing this was like I can get up and not have to worry that my phone's going off and have to be at the end of a phone call and have to do many things for her but then the other wave of not having to deal with the rest of the family was such a breath of fresh air because it really did allow me just to be me and it's and like I said, I turned 40. It was kind of, I'd always said to myself, I'm going to have my shit together when I'm 40. It's going to be, that is the point. So when 40 came, it was like, this is my life for living and my life only. And it's been fantastic. It's been absolutely amazing. So I know there's absolutely no going back. There can't be. So before we end off our show, are there any words of wisdom and advice or advice for everyone listening? The advice. I always kind of knew the red flags. I always knew that, you know, these relationships are not for you, but I always gave excuses. So I guess my advice is if you know it's not good, you don't have to tolerate it. If you wouldn't treat someone the way that someone's treating you question it and don't accept it because you don't have to and although going on no contact is is difficult it's very difficult because going no contact isn't going to be the end of it it's like they say there's going to be different waves and everything else but it once you get to the other side it's just so amazing so, Tessa, I really want to thank you for being a guest on our show today. You did a great job. Uh, thank you so much. You, you know, we, we learned a lot. You know, the fi family dynamics are always interesting. Not everyone's family is the same. And uh, you really did a service for everyone today. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I hope I have helped. That was the reason I wanted to come on, to share my story and, you know, people aren't alone. Well, Tessa, thank you once again for being a guest on our show. And if you want to be a guest like Tessa was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says guest form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our guest form page. Please do read all of the instructions on our guest form page and send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or... Uh, fill out our guest form and press the submit button. We're always looking for stories, so please do send in your stories. And if you need support, uh, we have a support group at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says support group. Click on that. It takes you to our very own safe social network inside. You'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoon, and Saturday night. We have forum boards for you to post on for your fellow survivors to give you support and validation we have ad free episodes on there as well and episodes that never made it to air and it's just a really good group of people so if you need support join our support group today and if you need even more support please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org there you can find articles and resources that help you make sense of what you are dealing with it's a really amazing organization on there they have the websites the phone numbers the email addresses for every shelter every domestic violence agency no matter how big or small your town or city is domesticshelters.org has everything there it's a wonderful organization so a big thank you uh, to them 
for just being them. And that is it for our show today. So a big thank you to Tessa. And from myself and Tessa, we hope you have a good night.